for um, the first seminar in the lecture series. And um, if you are here and able to, please turn on your camera just so to know, okay, yeah, active participation, seeing everyone, um, getting the mood up. And um, yeah, we're joined by Stavros Kusolas and Tanya Heert. Um, and to introduce them both, so Stavros is Assistant Professor of Architecture Theory in the Faculty of Architecture at TU Delft. We'll take on the first um, hour. And Tanya is Associate Professor of Theory and Methods of Urban Design and Section Leader of the Urban Design Section in the Department of Urbanism at TU Delft an academic and urban designer with an emphasis on urban transformation, methods of urban analysis and history theory of the city for the second hour. And in between, we will have uh, question rounds. We will have a break <laughs> to get some water. And uh, at the end, we will also have um, a common discussion because I've seen you filling in the Google Doc and it's amazing already many notions that we can explore together. Um, but yeah, without further ado, um, Stavros, please. Well, thank you, Seth. Yeah. What is more or less my time limit? It's like 45 minutes or not? Yeah, about 30 okay. minutes to 45 minutes. Okay, okay. Yeah. Just so I know. Let me share a screen as well. You can see it, I suppose, right? Yes. yes, perfect. Oh, the nicest image ever. <laughs> it is nice. Let, let me make it full screen, make it even nicer. Okay, good. Yeah, it's really fascinating. Tanya, you want to you wanna say where this image is coming from? Where is it coming from? Yeah. Do you know, it, the, rest? Do you know it, the rest of you, the image? Where is this coming from? You have to know that my husband is a physicist, so... Okay, so you definitely, you definitely know. <laughs> It's a great image and it's a great idea of collaboration and yeah. digitalization behind. So I'm not spoiling any, no, no, no disclaimer no. here. <laughs> I was not even going to say where it's coming from. I was going to leave it for the end. So yeah, it's not <laughs> okay. a spoiler, but it's also not a spoiler. It's the opposite. I suppose you might have been, uh, you might have been in touch uh, from, uh, I don't know, either Neger or Seth suggesting you a book by, by Benjamin Bratton on terraforming. And on the very beginning of the book, Bratton speaks precisely about this image and the black hole. This is a black hole. And how this image contradicts and comes, let's say, to start opposite to the other famous image, which is the blue marble, which is the earth taken from the outside as a picture. So it used to be that one small machine would go in the, in the sky outside of, uh, of the Earth's atmosphere and take a picture of it. Now it is that many hundreds and thousands small machines actually work together with us in order to take a picture of a black hole. Uh, in any case, this image is exemplary of what today it's called third order cybernetics or uh, cybernetize, cybernetization as a verb now, not just as a noun. And uh, more or less, it's going to be something you could have in mind while going through, through, through some of these points today. I have to make clear from the beginning that this lecture is, uh, and Tanya would be interested in that, she, she's also going to hear her name in the lecture, oh. is, is like a, an extended version of the introduction we wrote already, me and my colleague Dulmini, Dulmini Pereira, for an issue of Footprint. Uh, Footprint is a, is a journal of architecture theory and Negar is also involved in the editorial board as well, so am I. Uh, Footprint is an issue, is a general of architecture theory and the next issue coming up uh, end of May, beginning of June is going to be on cybernetics and uh, information. The title is called uh, All is Information, Cybernetics, Architecture and Ecology. And Tanya is also having a nice piece in there on, on, uh, on Cedric Price. So these five points are more or less the five points that uh, kind, of, uh, kind of describe the overall approach we're taking in the issue. So Tanya is already having the opportunity to read the introduction in, uh, in other words. So this is an extended version of this introduction. So I'm going to get it going and I'm going to be looking at some times and some notes because it's, as I was saying to Negar and Seth and Leah, it's a, it's a slightly early time for my, for my taste and my brain is not at its, uh, at its best. So as we all know, I mean, there's been many discussions, of course, on uh, data, cybernetics, digitalization, 
etc., etc., when it comes to the relationship with architecture, both in its practices and its theories. But there's been a problem, which at least we identify uh, doing, uh, doing that issue on footprint. But uh, most of these efforts to approach, uh, to approach the relationship between architecture and cybernetics were focusing on digital practices or digital aspects of uh, both architecture and cybernetics, which we kind of claim that it's slightly a, a limited approach. Since the emergence of, uh, of it as a field of studies after the post-war period, after the Second World War, cybernetics in both first and second orders, and I'm gonna, I mean, I don't know how much or not. Uh, Summers, I would say it's always good to kind of give a short description, okay. yeah. Okay, okay, okay. So ever since it emerged as a discourse, cybernetics has introduced architecture a systematic way of thinking, a systematic way of designing, while also trying to tackle issues, what we can call of complex problems, even if many of these times it has not been acknowledged as such. So we are taking logics that pertain to cybernetics, but perhaps many or most of the times we're not even aware of it. Now, as a quick clarification, uh, the first order cybernetics uh, that I was mentioning before, you can place it roughly from the 40s to the 60s, 65, 70s, is, uh, is the study of systems from the outside where the observer is not part of the system that's examining. While second order cybernetics is an extended, let's say an expanded version of this, a more immanent approach where the system that it studied and the observer are part of one and the same system again. So system and observer are working together. Um, I will return to this distinction a bit later on. Now, there is a third, uh, there is a third uh, order popping up, what is openly called third order cybernetics, or what you can also hear with the name cybernetize, cyberneticization, this very nice and easy name to say, which as again, as I was mentioning, takes it more to a verb approach, to a more enacted and more active approach. And um, in this, mode of thinking in this approach of cyberneticization, it is no longer cybernetics as, as an isolated field from other discourses and other fields. The main difference that this third order has with the so-called second order is that cybernetics open up to include a thousand different modes of cybernetics. And when I say a thousand different modes of cybernetics, it's going to be clear that these thousand different modes have little to do with what we call digital practices or even data, as we very broadly call them now. So the aim of the lecture today is to reposition cybernetics as neither an outdated nor a computational practice alone. So it's neither a historical thing of the past from the 40s to the 70s something, and it's neither something that we should also only examine it from a digital perspective, from a computational perspective. To understand how architecture and cybernetics are coming together and can be examined from a perspective that is neither only historical, not only digital, we will focus, I mean we, I don't know why I say we, I will focus, and you might agree or not agree with it, I will focus on a topic, on a concept, on a notion that binds them together and that is information. But information is going to be coming with a twist, it's not going to be the information we all think we, we know and we agree. And the first twist is to separate totally information from data. Uh, they're two different things. Before we do that, and while doing that, we need to do another clarification. There has been two basic directions, which both of them confuse information with data, so they don't make the separation. And these two basic directions are the ones that have influenced us. And when I say us, now I mean all of us indeed. I'm not, I'm not making... Uh, I'm not making a simplification. We have all been influenced by these two basic confusions, these two basic approaches, and we are still influenced. That is also why we still, most of the times, confuse information with data. The first approach, approach has to do with transmissibility. And it's an approach that understands information in terms of how data are transmitted between emitter and receiver. So from input A to output B, this transmissibility approach, which is called information theory. It's developed by Claude Shannon and Leon uh, Briouy, if I pronounce his name correctly. Information theory, and already the mistake is done by Shannon and Briouy to call it information theory, approaches information as the capacity of data to be transmitted. So how easy it is to transmit something from A to B. Next to that, there is another 
confusion when it comes to information, also called in the same naming, information theory, by this more uh, Eastern European, uh, let's say, field, this more Eastern European block, which confuses or misunderstands information from, for programming. In other words, how data can be compressed, how compressible they are, in order to be transmitted between emitter and receiver. Again, the point is that neither of the two, neither of the two approach information for what it probably might be. They approach it as if it were data. So they are actually data theories and not information theories. And the point is not to dismiss them. The point is to embrace them and work with them. And everyone, everyone, most of the people involved in cybernetics or, or digital practices are working daily with them. But we should not take them for information theories. We should take them for theories of algorithmic manipulation of data or any other, let's say, any other approach that deals with doing things with data. So when it comes to, to information and why it's different from data or from computational practices, there is a very nice quote by a behavioral psychologist and early cybernetician Gregory Bateson, which basically he's asking us that if in a computer which works by cause and effect with one transistor triggering another, the sequences of cause and effect are used to simulate logic. So computers simulate logic. 30 years ago, we used to ask, when he's saying 30 years, he means in the 1940s. Can a computer simulate the processes of logic? The answer was yes, but the question was wrong. We should have asked, can logic simulate all sequences of cause and effect? And he's responding that the answer could have been no. So Bateson is making a claim that goes even beyond, let's say, the dataification of logics. He's actually claiming that logics is just but one small part in trying to approach how this world gets informed and informs us. So in the approach, and might be wondering why you see a cut now, in the approach that we will follow today, there is a fair distinct conceptualization of information, which, which this conceptualization of information leads us to what I mentioned before, what is called today as third order cybernetics. In this third order cybernetics, information is not understood as data, is not understood as transmissibility or compressibility, is actually understood as the potential to energize the potential, okay? What do I mean by the potential to energize the potential? Now you might understand why the cut is coming. I already was discussing this yesterday with the students in, uh, in, in the studio we are running in the theory group. Uh, if I call you, some of you, I mean, I know better of you like Seth or Negar. I mean, if I call Seth or Negar and, uh, and I tell them that the cat is dead, uh, the cat is dead is to begin with, these three, four words coming together, you can understand them as data. They're like four words coming together and this could be taken as data. This data though, unless you have a cut, unless I have a cut or unless a beloved one of yours has a cut, is meaningless for you. It's not informative for you because if you have no cut or if you're not interested in cuts or if you don't know what the hell is, uh, is am I speaking about, then this is not informative. So the cut is dead can become information if it has the potential to energize a potential that you are also having. So it's not about the data as a valueless amount of stuff, things, binaries that can be compressed or transmitted. It's about the state of the receiver, a state of the receiver as me, as set, as anyone that receives something that can potentially be significant for them. And therefore, they are not generalizable. Information cannot be generalized for everyone. Information is always location specific, time specific, and let's call it, a, I don't, don't wanna say subject because both Leah, Seth and Negar know that I'm not fond of these subject object categorizations, but we can say, we can say receiver specific, okay? So thanks to the work of uh, Gilbert Simondon, who is uh, another, I wouldn't call him early cybernetician because he was a philosopher of technology, but he wrote, he didn't write substantially in general, he wrote just a couple of books or only a couple of books were published, but in one of these two books on the mode of existence of technical objects, he goes into quite some lengths in criticizing cybernetics. And this was already in 1959. So he was quite ahead of his time. He was criticizing him precisely on this, on, on their incapacity to speak of information in such terms. So according to him, information is basically what drives individuation. And when we say individuation, we mean becoming. And when we mean becoming, we mean how life lives. So how life 
moves on, how life transforms, how life is progressing. So Simondon is saying that life progresses because of information. Changes in life happen either for bad or for good because we find something as being significant. And when I say we, I don't mean only humans, because individuals find something as being significant and this motivates them to action. If they didn't find something significant, it would not have motivated anyone to action. So let's clarify a bit further that one and say why, I mean, at least briefly say why information drives life or drives individuation. Two quotes, the one by Stuart Kaufman who also involved in, involved in, in discussions on information. In the, this quote does not appear from a specific book of his. It's just, let's say, a private correspondence that they were having with another figure that could, we could say that opens up to discussions that could be called cybernetics, but of this third order. And this is Terence Deacon in a very nice book, which he had written recently called Incomplete Nature, where basically he's trying to explain and understand how our minds and by minds, not just the brains, but minds as our cognitive capacities, how these cognitive capacities emerge out of matter itself. They're not something separate from it. So Kaufman is saying in there that the first surprise is that it takes constraints on the release of energy to perform work, but it takes work to create these constraints. And the second surprise is that constraints are information and information is a constraint. The other quote is by the previous uh, guy I mentioned, Gregory Bateson, who is also claiming that information is a difference that makes a difference. Now, I have an example to make this clear, but just to clarify something before, when one understands information as constraints, it's quite easy to get it. Imagine just being on the traffic light and you can understand that when it's red, green or orange, this represents a lowering down of possibilities out of, let's say, the three options you have in there to slow down, to fully stop or to continue going. If the traffic light is red, it's a constraint that is informative for you because you know what not to do, okay? So that's how they're approaching information. Information is not just a proliferation of options, it's actually the opposite, it's a limiting of options. And that's why it's becoming informative because it limits the infinite into something more finite. Am I going too fast or not? Okay. So to understand the relationship between constraints, work, and differences that can make a difference, you can take the example of a simple thermostat, the ones that you probably have either behind you or somewhere in your living rooms. And that's also what you can see here in this slide. In this loop of differences that we can see there, we can see that there is a difference in the measured temperature in the room. So the thermostat measures a difference in the room. And this makes a difference in the winding on an, or the unwinding of a small metallic strip, which makes a difference in the tilt of a mercury switch, which makes a difference in the flow of current through the electric circuit, which makes a difference in the fuel or the gas that is introduced in the furnace or the boiler, which makes a difference in the temperature of the room. And this difference goes again and loops on itself and starts the whole process again. So there is a difference in intensity, but cascades into more and more differences of intensity that are producing themselves. Of course, this is a closed system. You should understand this as happening everywhere. So there is differences in intensity that cause more differences in intensity and more differences in intensity. So each of these elements that you see in this thermostat example or in this circuit here has been constrained because they did not, they did not emerge in nature, let's say, out of this. So when governed and constrained materials in order to allow energy to perform work. And each of these constrained elements also required work in order to be technologically coming together, technologically constrained. And moreover, the difference in temperature itself is a constraint that acts as a potential that energizes another potential, imposing further constraints that therefore allow the system to continue working. Why the difference, difference in temperature is a constraint? Because it already puts a constraint that you start working after 21 degrees or below, or you stop working above 25 degrees. So you don't continue working forever. There is a constraint informationally as to how many degrees are significant for you and above how many it's not significant for you. So this is also where the original account of, and the original wording even of a term, of a term cybernetics emerges again how to govern, and that's where it's coming from, the cyber note, let's say, the 
or Kubernetes, which is another, let's say, I mean, I'm going to make a parenthesis, I don't want to lose time, but there is two accounts. There is one saying that cybernetics come from Kubernetes, which means governor. There is another account which say that cybernetics as a term comes from Kubernetes, which is a, which is a sailor. It's the one directing, let's say, the direction of, a, of, a, of an ancient Athenian Greek ship. I think that they're both complementary and there's no point trying to figure out what's, what is more accurate. In the sort of sake of this discussion, I'm following the Kivernonaftis, meaning the sailor account, and I'm saying that it's actually, having all this in mind, it actually makes sense because you can understand that the governing of direction, the governing of directionality, and by the way, direction in French is called, and I think Leah could, uh, could confirm that, is called sense. So sense means direction in French, right? Yes which is going to be something we will return. So cybernetics is governing the directionality of constraints, the sense of constraints, in order to assist, meaning to help or to oppose, the work that is needed in order to produce more informational constraints. So cybernetics eventually is imposing a governing logics of directing constraints. To this end, and while remaining within the claim of Simon Don regarding information, we will approach cybernetics as the study, the production, the consumption, and the transmission of information. And again, this has nothing, nothing, has little to do with only digital logics. It's part of it, digital logics, but it's just part of it. Cybernetics is no longer only about the digital or the computational, it's about the general logics of government, governmentability, of how to govern not to govern in the parliamentary or the institutional sense, to govern even your everyday life of opening your, your car and driving, I mean, governing in general. So we would understand cybernetization as a process that can set the, can set the foundations of a rela relational account, of an account that examines relations. And in examining these relations, it also examines how science, how and when I say science, I mean intensive differences, differences in intensity. And I'm going to explain that. How signs are communicated and how meaning is produced and consumed within a system. Let me skip some parts and go straight to mentioning that to do this, and uh, I hope I have some time left. Yeah, I, have, I have 20 minutes more or less, right? Yeah, I think. Okay. There's going to be focus placed on five short points, which are the following sorry, extended automation, general ecology, a uh, different understanding of control, something which sounds very cryptic and it's going by the name, the one is the many, and pragmatics. And I'm going to try to do that as, as fast as possible. So now you're wondering why you have a toilet in there. I can give you the thorough account that I have written in front of me, but I can give you the smaller account. The smaller account is that this, what you see in front of you, is actually a process of automation. Automation has nothing to do, I mean, it has to do, but it has not only to do with automating machines or automating amazing things in a factory somewhere far away in Japan or, or, or with circuits that you can find in your computer or your phone. Automation is also your toilet in the sense that by the pushing of a button, you're automating a process that used to take 10, 20, half an hour minutes, 100 years ago, and meant you going with a bucket, taking the things out of there, going to the river or the pool or whatever, throwing them in there or somewhere else and taking water back and putting it back in the toilet. All this that used to take half an hour, it's being automated just with a push of a button. So automation in its own right is extended. It always has been extended. People like Bratton are claiming that the only thing we've been doing is actually automating further and further from the very invention of a human being we're just into a continuous process of automating things. By automating, we mean we are putting some of our energy out in the world in order for it to do the job for us, to work for us, so we don't have to work ourselves. So when information becomes the point of interest, design questions relating to emerging technological processes such as automated service systems, smart materials, predictive modeling, or even planetary scale infrastructures, so all these things, should be approached as processes that can be understood in this general cybernetics, in this third order cybernetics. So while the historical encounters I was describing before between architecture and cybernetics 
are important in order to understand our current technological condition, it is equally important to stress that architecture was never just a passive recipient of cybernetic ideas or notions, but it was in its own right contributing as an active agent, we could call it, in the transformation of the very logics of cybernetics as well. So when you understand expanded automation on the one hand and cybernetics as a general system of governmentability, then you see that architecture can stand in a very nice and interesting point in between the two. And it's not just something that is just getting influenced by a data, data let's say, theory or by just a, a mere stale information theory. So in doing that, in understanding architecture and cybernetics in a much more active relationship, uh, their history is less about the transfer of human agency to a mode of co-evolution. Architecture and cybernetics, cybernetics have been co-evolving. So the issue emerging out of these entanglements and this co-evolution is one, as I mentioned, which could be called very briefly extended automation, but not in the strict sense of programming and computer sciences only. So the automation of labor demanding, of work demanding processes needs to be examined both transversally and transdisciplinarily, so include many discourses in there. And also it needs to be understood in its full scale, which is no other than the planet itself. That's why also we started with the black hole image. The black hole image is a very characteristic image of a extended automation in a planetary scale. And if we do that, we see that we probably can find instances of these logics in all different scales, also architecturally speaking. So for example, this is coming from an article we have in, in Footprint. It's, from, uh, it's, 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 a, it's the work of Rachel Armstrong and Rolf Hughes, where they're actually developing in a nanoscale materials that could be, could be functioning as, as not only self-healing, but also depending on the, on the different times of the year, they could have different climate, climate, uh, climate behavior. And it's, it's actually working on the nanoscale in order to sustain the mesoscale, which is the architectural one. But also you can find it in even more mundane examples like the, the and that's from uh, Liz Galvez, another article we have in Footprint, like the ventilation of your kitchen and how it's automated. The very complex systems of kitchen ventilations, even in your building right now, it's an example of cybernetic logics at play. And a cybernetic logic that is also in its turn influenced by engineering or architecture practices. So how they're both working together. And in the same sense, another author in there, Christian Girard, he was also making the claim, and it's an architectural claim in its own right, because it is designed. The very first lunar, lunar module, the very first NASA lunar module that was used to land on the moon itself, it's also an example of, the, of cybernetics and design coming together, because it's an example of how can you govern, how can you steer the directionality of escaping the planetary constraints themselves, of escaping the planet even in its own right. So this question aim to understand, these questions, let's say, that put all these different scales together, aim to understand how architecture and thinking about architecture can approach our current challenges, the current technological challenges we're facing with a degree of care, a degree of care in the sense that Bernard Stiegler would, would, uh, would approach care. And uh, what do I mean by that? All these different instances from building bricks with na nanomaterial to ventilations in kitchens to even, let's say, lunar modules or the SpaceX of, of, uh, of this very likable person, Elon Musk. So all these different scales in there, what they demand is a renewed sensibility and also a renewed awareness of the intri intricate complexities of a planetary coexistence. We are all living in this together, human and non-human, and also in all different scales. And we need to develop a sensibility as to how approaching this co-living, this coexistence, and how to govern it, okay? And after all, again, I remind you, this sensibility is very close to the word sense. So sense and sensibility go hand to hand. You need sensibility in order to train oneself as to how to direct and intuit the better or more productive or more appropriate government, government, governmentability of, of, our, of our directionality, where we can go all together. So returning to Simon Don also, such, an, such a sense implies and demands a sensibility, as I was saying, and especially from an architectural perspective, because this indeed sensibility can potentialize and proliferate different what he calls technicities, 
which can extend what I can call as technological literacy. So now I realize I have to run. And now this is something that, uh, that uh, Tanya might recognize. So when I speak about technological literacy and how architecture can be approached in there, more than effect of uh, cybernetization, and now we're speaking about what is called general ecology, architecture contributes significantly, significantly as a medium, an informational medium, that distributes agency in its environment via different technicities. I'm going to briefly say what that means, which range both from the sensorial to the algorithmic, the nanoscale to the domestic, from the earth to the moon, as we were just seeing. So this redistribution of agency, or we can say power, is also a turning point in environmental logics, because eventually another claim is that cybernetics is an environmental logic, since it deals with how systems are related with each other. I have to remind that ecology means the logics of distribution in a system. It's not about green things only or about trees. So cybernetics are implying an environmental thinking, which has to do with how different, let's say, different forms of agency and power are distributed within systems. An example, according to my book at least, that Tanya probably might have a different approach and she could, uh, she could say so in the next, uh, in the next lecture, lecture. An example of how understanding agency as distributed is the work of Cedric Price, where architecture, again from me, in, in Price becomes something that we can understand as a relay, as a transductive relay, where information is distributed. You can see this in the play, in the, it's called the Fun Palace, right? Yeah, I take it as a distribution of information in there. People get to have the capacity to be both informed and inform others in the Fun Palace. But then we can debate that later on. So between an already structured and fixed individual and its environment, and I'm gonna say now what transduction stands for, I, I have to make a parenthesis. I don't know if I'm doing well in terms of time. I don't think I'm doing very well in terms of time. <laughs> so knowing, knowing what I still have to say. So perhaps I might need to start improvising. So I apologize in advance if I want to make all my points here. So I'm going to skip many things and focus on what is the definition of transduction because it's important. So for Simon Don, transduction is defined as such. A physical, biological, mental or social operation which through, an activity, through which an activity propagates from point to point within a domain, while grounding this propagation in the structuration of a domain, which is operated from place to place. Each region of a constituted structure serves as a principle of constitution for the next region. So basically, transduction is a term that Simon Don uses in order to explain how information moves. Okay, uh, Information in the sense that you see or you perceive a constraint that is informative for you, aka the cat is dead. You get informed. And then the, the actions that this information potentializes create and produce new information that you might give to someone next to you or to an object next to you. And this process of moving from an informational moment to another informational moment is what Simon Don calls transduction. So the moving, let's say, the bleeding of one, of one small light that leads to the bleeding of another small light and another small light and another small light, this is a transductive process. It's how information moves within a domain. Such examples where you can see architecture operating transductively, in other words, assisting information to move, giving you potential to energize your potential, you can find not only in price, also more or less in the same time period, you can see that constant, constant new house, new and house, I always make his last name <laughs> difficult to pronounce, in his new Babylon, for example, he also had very similar speculative extrapolations on how we could design urban environments where via automation, extended automation, could be going to a point where collectivities could emerge, different collectivities would emerge, work conditions would change, entertainment would change as well. In other words, during that period, both price or or constant and many more were experimenting with an approach that brought a cybernetics and architecture in a way that was not just what can we do with data. It was much more amplified. Unfortunately, we lost that, mm -hmm. slightly lost that lately. This is also where the second order of cybernetics emerged, more or less again in the end of the 60s, beginning of the 70s. So let me see, let me see, because I have to improvise heavily, I think. 
Yeah, a few more minutes. Few more minutes, right? Yes, impossible that there's gonna be done in few more minutes. And we can, you know, like it's we fine, also have fine, question fine, round. I can yeah. go. I can go very quickly. No, the point is the point that I can go very quickly and do it now, uh, and it's my fault because I always get carried away and I introduce. I mean. Most of the things I'm saying are not even the notes. It's things that are coming in my, in my in my mind while speaking about them. So when I was practicing, it was much more in time. But in any case, what uh, another great and important thing that I would say for our current condition, which is Eric Hell, and his book General Ecology is a very important book because it's one of the books that more or less define what we now call third order cybernetics. What he's claiming in there, among many other things, is that given all this, we should move. from the so-called about anthropos or the human being as the one which is in the center of causing whatever it might be causing in this planet in all its different scales, but rather speak about technology. Technology as technicity in the sense that Simon Don was saying. So it's not about a technical object, a person and them doing something. It's about how the person does things with a technical object in order to change their environment and how this circuit of person, technology, environment all co-transform when one is doing that. So if we constantly transform ourselves, our technology and our environment by our, by our technological actions, then perhaps it's better to speak about the technocene as a general condition. And in the technocene, we can actually start speaking about something that he calls te techno-ecological culture. So it's a culture that brings together both the natural and the so-called artificial understands them together and tries to find ways that via logics of cybernetization, for example, we can find ways that we can govern this technological with a certain degree of care, with a certain degree that we don't continue screw up everything. And when I say screw up, it's not a moralist argument. It's an argument that has to do with a more Spinozian ethological understanding of screwing or not screwing. Uh, when, when I say Spinozian, now I'm, I'm running like crazy, as you can imagine, but it's not. <laughs> When I say uh, Spinozian, and that's also another comment, uh, that's something that should be clear. We should get rid of an understanding of, uh, of uh, cybernetics or digital practices that confuse them with control. It's very important to figure out why it should not be confused with control. Why actually, if we relinquish the illusion of control, we might actually have a much more better grasping on how to govern. So controlling is not about, it's not about restricting, it's rather about intuiting directionality, as I'm going to be insisting. Control, controlling is not about bringing things in a, in a pot and placing strict barriers. It's about knowing how, when you place strict barriers on something, this might probably start escaping from the sides if it's too liquid, or it might start evaporating if it gets too warm. And I'm speaking about the example of warming up water, for example. So if you want to control water, you need to know how to intuit its transformations rather than putting it in a box. So it's a different understanding of control. I don't know if I'm clear. I'm simplifying heavily as... You can see, uh, that's a very nice, you can read it in, in the upcoming product placement I'm doing. In the upcoming issue of Footprint, not only Tanya's article, you can also read another very nice article by Contingent Collective, they are called, and they have very nice diagrams on how cybernetics could be approached from many different perspectives. This is one that diagrammatizes the differences in how cybernetics of different orders were related with control. I think it's very informative. Mm. Uh, yes, yes, that was something nice that had to do with technological alienation, then it's gone. The one is the many, has to do with an understanding that we need, and I need to show you this. Of course, we don't need an understanding of our relationship with cybernetics that goes back to what Oxman is doing, so imitating so-called nature or imitating natural shapes and forms. So we don't need an organicism to fight machinism. We actually need an organomachinism, and already in the 80s, people like Haraway in the Cyborg Manifesto, and this is the Italian version of the Cyborg Manifesto, we're claiming that it's not about saying that we are all the same, we are all one, that's where this critic phase goes, neither we are all different, we are neither many. The one is the many in the sense that we are all in this together, we are all coexisting, but we are coexisting with some differences as well. And the important thing is to find how different degrees of coexistence can amplify or diminish our differences. So it's not about saying that we are the same as machines, neither saying that machines are the same as human beings. It's about finding the differences between the two and finding how productively we can come into a cybernetic 
relation, okay, in the relation of governmentability, but we work together. That's why she has a computer keyboard, some circuits, a lady, which is native, by the way, it's not a white lady, animals, cosmic, uh, cosmic stuff in the background, everything. So all of this, which is not that she decided to put them in there together, all of these are together by default, they need to be understood in their productive differentials, not just accumulating them and saying, ah, oh, they're all the same. A lady, a cat, and the, and the computer, same stuff. Neither saying that, no, the computer is more important or less important. It's finding how they work together. Okay, uh, yes, yeah, that's gonna take me a last minute. When I was speaking about this productive relationality and finding how we work all together, and you're wondering why I'm having, I'm having some pills in there. I mentioned that it's understanding that it's not based on morality, but it's based on a Spinozian form of ethics. This Spinozian form of ethics is easy understood when you think of it in terms of a Panadol. So I'm not going to claim that Spinoza was thinking in terms of Panadols or Depons or pills, but it's an easy way to understand it. If you have a headache and you take one pill, one Panadol, probably it might help you getting rid of the headache. If you have a headache and you get 200 of them, so all this pack here, you're probably going to end up in the hospital. So our relationship with machines or data or anything that pertains to the digital domain is exactly the same. It's not that they are good or bad inherently. It's not that we are good or bad inherently. It's the very relationality with them, the limits we need to trace, the limits we need to sense, and that's why we need the cybernetic logics in order to find out these limits. And in finding out these limits, experiment and speculate on how much of a dosage, on how much of an amount is actually helping our goals or is actually going against us. And this is something that cannot be found in advance. This is something that needs to be thought, practiced, speculated, and experimented. You cannot know, you cannot know how many coffees you need to wake up in the morning. Each of you might, some might drink one, some zero, some might need three to wake up. This was not given to you in a list of texts, let's say that you had to follow the guidelines. You found out for yourself because you practiced the relationality of your body with a <clears throat> chemical compound called coffee caffeine and how this enhances your not. It's the same attitude I'm claiming we should adapt with technology. It's an attitude of experimentation, of speculation, an attitude where it's not opposed to us, neither is more important nor less important, an attitude where we have to find our limits and we have to find them in the sense of being able to understand what sort of signs are produced from each side. And that's the last comment I'm going to make and we can discuss later on, when I'm speaking of science or when I was speaking before about science and saying that information is most of the times expressed in science, I was not speaking about language nor about science in the sense of writing, I mean, writing something in a, in a paper and the letters become the science. Signs are much more general and amplified and to understand them properly, you can even think of a flag moving in the wind. Signs are intensive differences the same way that Bateson was mentioning information as intensive difference. When the flag is to it, pressure appears on its surface and it starts to moving. This movement of the flag, which you see from your window and you realize it's windy, therefore you might need to get better dressed, it's a sign that can inform you. Okay, the movement of the flag, the drops of the rain, all these are signs which are non signifying. They're nothing to do with language. They have to do with information in this general sense. Information as everything around you, not just, not just the human domain of information, neither the digital domain of data manipulation. And again, I'm claiming that only when we get sensible to this level of science, information, and their capacity to alter us we can be able to also approach cybernetics in the proper manner that they were meant to be. And I'm not saying that teleologically, I'm saying meant to be because by default, even etymologically, they are there to assist our government ability. Yeah. I, I compressed half the lecture in five minutes, but it's okay. No, it's I'm perfectly done. fine. I mean, I'm totally sure that we are going to um, dive deeper into some notions. Well, I wanted to highlight a few things already before we go to the break and before we go to Tanya and then before we go to the general discussion because um, 
some elements of your lecture now, Stavros, are fundamental already because in these, um, so students have to write reflections on the yeah. suggested literature and um, some things have already uh, popped up or have been already debunked by your yeah. lecture. So separating information from data, that is one thing that has um, appeared time and time again in the written pieces. I'm looking mm -hmm. at uh, Fatih. Um, yeah, take, take note because it's very important to mm -hmm. separate mm -hmm. data from information and information cannot be generalized and that's something um, also important for everyone because in taking this generalization of in the first uh, moment <clears throat> equaling data to information and then generalizing all information for every subject yeah. within a, a nation state within a world within a, like the general planetary scale you're already overriding so many um, individual ca characteristics in this um, degrees of coexistence and the productive differentials. So again, yeah. taking on to the Haraway um, note by mm -hmm. Stavros. And another important thing is the question, who governs who? So um, by taking this leap from um, productive information and then thinking in a more critical way, who governs who or who, what data is being made productive, then you can also think in a more generative way on this info war or the cyber war that Yuk Hui um, posed in his paper. Yeah, yeah, you, mm -hmm. yeah I don't know, but this is the need for a break, I suppose, by many, but let me just say that the, um, the, the commentary that Yuk Hui is generally doing throughout his, throughout his works and his books, he uses a term which he calls cosmotechnics, and it's a term. Uh, the term itself is very close to what Simon Dole was calling technicity. What I very briefly <laughs> and simplifyingly try to describe as uh, as not being a one direction relationship, but as being something that is reciprocal. So, us, our technology and our environment, we are co-transforming in any technological in the moment of any technological act, and uh, that is a term that uh, Yu calls cosmotechnics, and he's actually claiming that the dataification or the dataism meaning the obsessive and the excessive, let's say, confusion of information with, to data, so understanding information as data and not as what it truly is, and also focusing excessively on a discourse that develops around data, but loses focus on what data, I mean, what, what are they, why are they here? I mean, what are we doing with them? I mean, okay, data, we can compress and transmit them, 5G, 6G, 20G, it's fine, okay. But what are we doing with that? I mean, why are we doing even that? So this focus, who is saying this focus is a general problem of what he calls based again on Simon Don a technological illiteracy so we are becoming more and more illiterate as to not only data are how are they are produced but also how they are consumed which machines support data where is the directionality of data going depending on which machines are used we're losing losing focus on all of this and by losing focus on all of this we are falling easier praise to logics of I mean Andre my colleague Andre Radman calls it echo chambers so where you're shouting and you just hear your voice a bit louder yeah. imagine going shopping in amazon and you buy a book and then you get other users like you have bought also these books so you continue buying books that are supposedly of your same group there's no opening to any kind of productive difference you know where i get to buy a book that tanya recommended not just because i bought the same from before but because she thinks but informatively, we might co-work into collectively doing something that it was not just to reinforce my own given beliefs or her own given beliefs, mm. you know? So data falls into these logics when it's only directionality is that of profit, which is what it basically is most of the times nowadays. Yeah. But to say that we need to go against the use of data only for profit, we don't need an ideological decision. We don't need to wake up and say, uh, say we have a communist manifesto and go and take the data centers. That's pointless. We need to be technologically literate about what this information, how are data produced, how can we redirect them, how can we hijack them, you know? Yeah, but that's also, I believe, one of the main pillars of this studio, becoming 
literate of all these scale variances of all of the um, um, trajectories that this in, in that this information flows into and by becoming technological literate and by becoming aware of all these scale differences you can intuit better the position of you know like the 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 end design or whatever is going to be produced in the studio and the different relations it will have to all of the of the objects within this constellation that you will think of in your in your narrative so it's super important to trace um yeah all these relations and also to trace the limits of these relations well with that being said please write down your questions think of it and uh, let's have a five minute break and um 